And good evening. I'm Jonathan Higgins. I'm Rich Carlson. And we're the Scanner Guys. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We've got a great show. Um, as many of you uh, saw the show topic, let me bring that up again just so we can see what it is. It's a uh, police scanner, simulcast reception without, no. without an SDS 100 or 200. Yeah, you don't have to spend the big bucks all the time. Yeah, and many of you out there probably have a phase two digital scanner and you're running into simulcast issues. We're going to try to give you some tips and suggestions to try to address that and try to make things better. I mean, the thing is, is as we, we're not going to sugarcoat it, the SDSs yeah. are pretty expensive. Yeah, if, if you really have a problem and you really, get, really need to listen to it, you got to break down and spend the money. But if you don't have the money, you don't want to spend the money, or it's not your everyday listening, there are things you can do that sometimes help. Yeah, and that's all, you know, tips and tricks we're going to share with you tonight. As always, uh, the Scanner Guys are brought to you by uh, Scanner Master. So uh, definitely uh, think of our sponsor anytime you're looking to purchase any scanners or accessories or anything like that. In the uh, description below, there's an affiliate link. Click that. Uh, yep. Anything that you purchase there will help benefit uh, the channel, the Scanner Guys channel, and we appreciate that. So let's... Um, Let's dive into this topic and see what we can share with you guys tonight. But first, we'll get a little bit of business done. Okay. Um, follow, like, and subscribe to the Scanner Guys. Uh, we're on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. While you're here, you're here right now. Hit that subscribe yep. button. Do that right now. Uh, give us a thumbs up as well. Uh, we would love to see that. Post your questions and comments over on the live chat we're going to get to those at nine o'clock eastern time and then we spend about 30 minutes uh doing those so in case you're watching us for the first time first hour we cover the topic of discussion next 30 minutes or so we cover your questions whether they're related to the topic or something in general related yep. to the hobby we'll be happy to cover all that so uh, check out our website. We've got a lot going on there. We're going to be working on the website even more. Um, we have a blog that's there, a newsletter that you can sign up for. And we also have a store where you can purchase hats, T-shirts, coffee mugs right from our website, um, thescannerguysshow.com. So definitely check that out. So what is simulcast? Some of you are saying, what the heck is simulcast? Yeah. It, there is a definition for it. And basically, it, the simulcast means that you've got multiple towers talking at the same time on the same frequency with the same information. Now, old school simulcast, Rich, when a lot of agencies made the switch from their conventional system to their trunking to a trunking system, they would do a different type of simulcast. Yeah, and what they would do is they would link the new system to the old system so that if you were talking on the old system, the guys on with radios on the new system would hear you. They call it simulcast. I call that multicast um, because you're on multiple systems. Um, so, yeah, the terminology gets bandied about. It's like Kleenex and Puffs. It's all Kleenex, but it's not Kleenex. It's made by somebody else. Simulcast, the technical description is that it's the same information on the same tower, on this, or on multiple towers on the same frequencies at the same time. The true definition of the other thing where the trunk system is also uh, connected to the conventional channels or vice versa, technically that's multicasting. So... We had a little fun doing this slideshow presentation. We have our doctor there over on the uh, the left of your screen. Um, symptoms of simulcast. Your scanner may be experiencing some of those symptoms of simulcast. <laughs> Digital burping every few minutes. Yep. Even with a strong signal. Yeah, and that's typically worse. When the signal's strong, is it's, it's worse. So... Um, that's going to play into what we're going to talk about a little bit later on. Missing parts of the conversation. 
you dropouts in audio. Now, this is not the same as those dropouts that you do for priority and weather alert and close call. Yeah, although sometimes they can be confused with that. Uh, yes. We've had callers that are saying that I turned off my close call, but it's still dropping out. I said, well, yeah, maybe you got something else going on. So. And the other thing, you see that signal meter woo, 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 constantly back and forth. Yeah. That's that another attack. Yeah, that's another culprit of simulcast. Yeah, absolutely. So if you have any of these symptoms, well, not you, your scanner, <laughs> uh, consult your doctor. Just kidding. Um, but anyway, the scanner doctors are in. But yeah, that's going to be the, the the three major things that are you know going to be a culprit. You know, you're not going to have an enjoyable listening experience. Essentially, yeah. And like Joe mentioned, that it, unless you've got an SDS scanner or maybe one of the Unications or a Motorola or Harris type two-way radio on the system, these are band-aids. They're not real fixes. It's not going to heal the situation. It's going to help overcome some of the symptoms. Yeah. If you are really serious about it, spend the money, make the investment, get the SDS scanner, and be done with it. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be your best bet to be able to uh, resolve that. Uh, the unication radios are another. Um, if you're just looking to strictly just monitor a particular system and not worried about all the functionality of a scanner, a yeah. unication radio will work as well. Um, that was the big thing before the SDSs came out. That was one of the consumers. Yeah. You know, piece of his equipment that they could go to to be able to address it. It was really the only radio at the time before the SDSs came out. It was the only radio of easily available to the hobbyist that overcame those things and that you could actually program without tearing your teeth out. Um, and then when the SDSs came out, they say all the unications plummeted. But yeah, um, I'm just blown away, you know, with. With even with the SDSs and the Unication radios, mm -hmm. I remember going into a large box store with that metal roof, and you remember what would happen. Yep. The signal would go away, you yep. know, because of building saturation and so on and so forth. And, you know, I've taken, when I was testing out the SDS 100, I mm -hmm. said, I'm going to really put this radio to the test and yep. take it into a big box store listen to a trunk system mind you the first time i tested it i was in seekonk massachusetts in one of those craft stores i don't remember which one it was one you know like michael's or yeah, hobby, hobby ac something. more yeah. yeah um so i was in there and i was listening to the rhode island trunk system swansea's you know right over the line into Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Swansea, Massachusetts, Rhode Island. So I figured this is going to put the radio through to a tr true test. So I said, it sounds great on the outside of the store. Let's see what happens when I get in the middle of the store. And I was just blown away. I'm like, holy crap, you know, yep. this is working really well. I had the same thing when the SDS came out. I had a hard time picking up a couple of the sites uh, in the my, in my area from where I'm at, I live way out in the middle of absolute nowhere, and there is one site that I can pick up regularly here on most of my scanners. And I got the SDS, and now all of a sudden I'm picking up sites that I've never heard before from my house. So the Rhode Island trunk system is 800 megahertz, um, mm -hmm. and usually you know 800. As we know, 800 stinks for the most yeah. part. Yeah, it's got different coverage dynamics than other bands. Yeah, that's for sure. Let's continue on with the uh, slideshow here. So here's our typical digital signal. Nothing too fancy. This would be like an analog, com no, excuse me, a digital conventional signal. Yeah. So we see there that the signal transmits in binary code, zeros and ones. And, it, and the 325P2, guess what? It's not having any problems. Because it's a it's a conventional digital signal, so it's picking it up perfectly, working real well, no issues whatsoever. 
then we go into this. <laughs> now look at what we have here, Rich. We've got the same binary code and the same frequency all right. happening at the same exact time. What do you think is happening inside your scanner right now? Oh, it's tearing its crystals and, and, and resistors out of its head because it doesn't know how to process these. And the problem isn't so much that it's receiving two signals, it's that their time frames are slightly off. So the zeros from the big tower and the ones from the little tower are combining and canceling each other out and just confuses the heck out of the scanner. So it's receiving the data at different times and it's just it's just like if if we had, you know, if Rich and I were talking to you at the same exact time. I mean, how would you be able to listen to us if we were both yapping at you at the same time? Yeah, so uh if you're if you start talking and I start talking at the same time, you're not going to be able to hear it. Is it going to be confusing? You're going to be doing this, going back and forth. You know, it's and just, adding something yeah, on it top just makes of it, it. Crazy, you know. <laughs> and adding something on top of it, Rich. We're reading from the same script. Yeah. But you know, I'm slightly behind you, and you're a little bit yeah. ahead. Yeah, you're half a word behind me, and uh, and it's just like that weird echo going yep. on. And the scanner just doesn't know how to process it. The Older scanners were never designed for that, and they don't know how to process it. Uh, it's like, you know, you've been a Mac user all your life, and then all of a sudden they stick you in front of a Linux machine, and you're like, oh, <laughs> you know. yeah. I mean, I mean, trunking, you know, for most of our audience members, have you know, it came around in our lifetime. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is all new. I mean, you know, a new technology. We went from trunking to digital and then and then digital involved, you know, to simulcast systems. Oh, yeah. Rich, basically, why would a department want one of these simulcast systems? It provides better coverage throughout its coverage area. So if you've got a wide area, like the size of an entire county, mm -hmm. and uh, it the engineers will look at the situation and decide, well, we need, in order to cover that, cover that area, we need to have seven towers scattered okay. throughout the area. They can do one of two things, or actually they can do a combination of both of them. They could have each tower have its own site number and its own frequencies, uh, which might be kind of a waste of frequency channel, uh, uh, frequency resources. Or they could have simulcast towers where each of the seven towers all transmit on the same frequencies. They share all the same channels and all transmit at the same times. The subscriber fleet, the mobile portable radios that actually use the system, were designed for that and work much better on that. And it provides a more seamless coverage area throughout your coverage, uh, throughout your, your county or whatever the, the region is. Some places will decide to do that with a north set and a south set, depending on the frequencies available and the engineering involved. And so they'll have a set of simulcast systems on the south and one with a set of simulcast towers on the north and kind of combine the two processes. But basically, it comes down to engineering and the resources available. I got gotcha. you. Um, so what ends up happening to um, the radio user? Is it subscribing to one tower that's closest, essentially? Yeah. Each of the towers on a simulcast site, so let's say we have seven sites okay. in our Mayberry County simulcast system. Each of those seven uh, tower sites will transmit the same uh, site ID, if you know what a site ID is, and if you've listened to some of our previous shows, you probably do. Um, and everything about that to the subscriber is identical on all seven sites. Same site ID, same system ID, uh, same everything, same frequencies and the whole bit. As far as the radio is concerned, it's all just one site with multiple transmitters. Okay, I get you. So that's a, so this scenario here with our current scanners, it's like literally a blender. Mm-hmm. So this is coming in, 
and this is coming in. And then as Rich mentioned earlier, at different time, because one is a little bit quicker than the other, so that binary code is going in there, getting shuffled up and like, uh, yeah. it can't do it. So that's yeah. where we get one, mm -hmm. the dropouts in audio, some of the burping and hiccuping, yeah. and the wonky signal meter. Yeah, and the reason it's happening is tower the big tower like i said is is five miles away and the little tower is 12 miles away and it even though radio waves move at the speed of light 186,000 miles per second is what it, what that is i think for my high school science days <laughs> it does take a little time and since it's all just ones and zeros that's just one tiny little bit of thing and it and that distance uh difference does make a difference in the uh, relative time it takes to get from Tower A and Tower B to the subscriber out in the field. So you know, it might be two or three uh, bits different from the two towers, and then the radio just goes. Yeah, like uh, an example of this, many of you probably heard, you know, a couple of uh, firemen or officers mm -hmm. on scene and, you know, one guy's transmitting on his radio and you hear a half a second delay of his voice in the background. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, which yeah. is interesting. The other thing that a cool experiment that you can do, listen to your SDS. Mm -hmm. to the on a trunk system and then listen to like a 536 or one of the other models you're yeah. going to hear that delay as well we had a funny little story as long as we have time uh in the back in the chicago area we had a um a, a mutual aid channel we call it ispert and it was a vhf channel there was a uhf system a uhf repeater that repeated that, that was hosted by one of the dispatch agencies, mm -hmm. and there was a link to it to the Starcom digital system. So if I had three scanners, one on the VHF, one on the UHF, and one on the 800, Go there's a bit three. of latency. The VHF is real time. Yeah. The UHF, since it was a patch, had a quarter second delay or half second latency, and then the trunk system had another half a second latency over that so you're hearing it with three different time <laughs> frames on these three systems with the digital processing even on an analog signal that's being retransmitted on digital it does take some time and there's going to be some latency uh involved in the analog to digital conversion and then the uh digital to analog reconversion so you're going to have those issues, and that's why you're going to get that echoey effect um, when you're hearing this coming from two different sources. Oh, wow. But that, I mean, that's uh, super interesting with, with just the technology and just how mm -hmm. it's, I mean, so much is involved, you know, now. Oh, yeah. with, uh, with it. And a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of agencies are still doing that multicasting, as you said. Yeah, um, and again, regardless of the terminology that you use, the terminology that I was taught by radio guys when I was in the business is that the proper, you know, multicasting is two different channels or two different systems linked um, to provide that, and simulcasting is where everybody's on the same uh, frequency. There, there's quite a discussion going on in the comments on that. We'll address that real quick different uh, types of communications agencies might use the terminology different. So back in the older uh, TV days, back when there was uh, cable TV and antenna TV, which I assume there's still antenna TV out yes. there. Okay. Oh yeah, definitely there is. Yeah, um, but uh, they would use uh, multiple towers, but they were usually on different channels. So you would have a tower in Phoenix, and then another tower in Whitman, and then a third tower in Wickenburg to provide coverage. But the one in Phoenix was on channel six, the one in Wickenburg was on channel 14, and the one in Whitman was on channel 36. So that's, we would call that multicasting because they're on different frequencies. 
they call it simulcast because that was the terminology they used. Yeah, that's a lot of, of large territories. That would be the the thing to do yep. uh, with uh, with doing that. Um, I mean, we could go into television. I, I know I have a little bit of background on that yeah. as well, but we don't. We're not going to do that tonight. <laughs> um, so this is exactly the ex example that Rich was explaining with the seven towers. Mm -hmm. So we've got our uh, Whistler um, ten forty right in the middle of it. Yep. And, and it's, two of the towers are hidden by the scanner. That's why you only see five. There are two of them behind the scanner. Take my word for it. Yep. So you've got you've got the uh, you've got the radio here, and it's getting confused. Yeah. Um, and as this is a little review, we actually covered some of this already. Mm -hmm. So the simulcast sites are transmitting on the same set of frequencies from each tower. Right. All of the traffic is identical on each frequency at each tower. Each simulcast tower transmits from the same ID. And it's all considered as a single site for scanner programming. Yeah. And one thing that will happen is on a trunking system, on any trunking system, if one of the transmitters, one of the radios in the system goes bad, so if you got your tower and there's five radios, one for each of the five channels, and one of those channels go bad, that radio is out of the system, and now you're down to a four-channel system versus the five-channel system originally. On a simulcast, now you've got five radios at each of these seven sites. That means you've got 35 radios. If one of the transmitters go bad on one of the tower sites, then that channel is locked out from all the sites on that simulcast site. So wow. even though all the other radios are still working, because one of them is bad on one of the towers, all the that other cha that channel is now locked out from that entire simulcast site until they get that fixed. Wow! So it's smart enough to be able to and not only it's communicating yeah. with the other sites to be able to say, okay, this yep. channel is down, so it's down throughout the whole entire system. Yeah, exactly. Now, there might be this if the system is large, like a large statewide system, uh, they may reuse that frequency at a different site at a distant location. So like Starcom in Illinois, if that bad re uh, transmitter is in Chicago, that if that same frequency is being used in, Str in Springfield on a different site number, then that's going to be unaffected. It's just that those five or seven towers in the Chicago area just won't be able to use that channel. That simul class a cast cluster. Cluster, there you go. Yes. Yeah, say that real fast. Several I'm, times. <laughs> yes. Let's continue on with the uh, presentation. Now, there's simple ways to combat, uh, combat simulcast. I mm -hmm. mean, there are several different ways. We're going to go over them tonight. Uh, we want to give you some examples. Uh, you may think of some on your own, um, but these are some of the common ways. Um, you probably heard about the paperclip. I know it's been mentioned a lot on Radio Reference yep. with using a paperclip. Now, you're going to notice with the tips that we're suggesting. Now, our rule of thumb, Rich, and we say it all the time when we're talking about signals, up I mean, out and up. Up and out. Yep. Up and out. That makes uh, the best antenna is normally up and out. Unfortunately, with simulcast, you don't want the best antenna. Yep. The better and, antenna makes it worse. And the reason for that, let me back up to that slide again. So you see, if you've got a really, really good antenna in the middle of this hot mess, you're going to have even more simulcast issues because yep. you're going to receive not only the towers that are neighboring you, you're going to start receiving more towers mm -hmm. in this cluster. Yep. And again, the more the merrier does not apply in simulcast. No. So paperclip, directional antennas are two things that help you to fix the hopefully overcome simulcast yeah basically what happens is you're picking up two or three sites and the radio is for lack of a better term being overloaded not quite but sort of and the whole idea is to kind of list lessen uh the ability to hear 
all the sites except for one. Yeah, so you don't want to have the best antenna if you're trying to narrow it down to one site. Right. So that's definitely a key. That's why the paper clip is so small mm -hmm. and it's going to limit or reduce down reception. And you can sort of make it directional too. Which we'll, we'll show you a photo of that. So let's take a look at some Yagis. If you've been to the Scanner Master website, the owner, Rich Barnett, I'm going to call him out on this, loves directional antennas he loves yagis oh, and you know, know he'll go out and work on a project and he'll have our receiving manager order a new or different yagi antenna and it'll be the perfect antenna for the job and he'll list it on the website so you'll see a whole slew of yagi base antennas yeah. different sizes different everything yeah so keep in mind when you go to that portion of the website there's going to be a lot of options yes uh, yagi antennas are great because you remember the old television antennas back in the day when you didn't have cable and you had broadcast television was your only option right. you know mom and dad probably had um an antenna on the roof and a little rotator Yep. So you you know you wanted to watch uh, CBS tonight, so you'd have to move that antenna in a certain direction to get CBS. Yep. Um, you know to what was on CBS back in the day? I, you know the Ed Sullivan I, Show. Uh, All in the family. <laughs> yeah. So you know if you wanted to watch that, you had to turn the the yep. the uh, antenna in that direction, and then it would get a nice good signal. But if you were watching ABC and they were a little further over it might come in snowy yep so it's the same type of concept with a yagi antenna is you're aiming it at the transmit site you're just basically right. saying i want to receive this site and this site alone and it's made so the things that are in the other directions are kind of tuned out yeah exactly and not only does it focus the power or the capability of the antenna in a specific direction it excludes stuff off the sides of the antenna so it, you can force it to listen to tower a and ignore towers b and c so when you get one of these yagi antennas let's say you want to give this a shot if you're able to afford it put up a rotator yeah because this will give you a great opportunity to experiment without having to go up in the ladder and move the antenna constantly. Yeah, I had a Yagi up in my attic, and um, I had it mounted on a, uh, a large wooden dowel. And I poked a little hole into the ceiling and let the, the dowel through the ceiling hole. And I had a mark on the dowel so I knew which way the point of the Yagi was. And I could reach up into my closet and turn that dowel by hand and that worked great but that was with an attic antenna you're not going to do that with a rooftop antenna so buy one of those tv rotators and rotate that antenna so you can point that thing in any directional and yes tv antennas were log periodic antennas which is the proper term for it they are a different technology than yagi but with the, pretty much the same results it yes. made a nice directional pattern reception pattern yeah it's not yeah that's exactly i was just using the television antenna as yeah. an example that we, we can really sure everybody yes you know, we're trying we... to make it relatable to something that you <laughs> yeah. know you're used to yeah exactly and then the next line on there sometimes the closest antenna isn't always the best that's another trick is don't point it at the closest antenna point it at a different antenna that isn't going to be really strong and sometimes that'll work better. Trial and error is your friend. So the next question we're probably going to get is, how do I know where these antenna sites are? Now, Radio Reference is a wealth of knowledge. And if yeah. you go to their website and you, and you go digging into the FCC call sign for there, there will be a map that will show where all the towers are for a simulcast system. It will even list uh, the address on some of those. So what you can do 
is figure out where they are. And like Rich said, exactly, trial and error. You want to try each one of these sites until you get the site that works the best. Yeah. And like I say, even if you don't know where the, exactly where the tower sites are, especially if you have a rotator, you know, just try to find the best one. If you don't have a rotator and that that Yagi is going to be stuck in the same direction once you get it installed, if you can, bring your scanner up to the antenna with a jumper and, you know, Stand on the roof with your scanner in one hand, hook to a jumper to your antenna, and get that antenna pointed in the right direction before you bolt it down. Yeah, these are all uh, all good things, you know, with uh, tips regarding Yagi antennas. So let's uh, continue on. Now, Rimtronics antennas, Rich. Uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, Rimtronics antennas. Well, basically... Uh, it isn't so much just the Remtronics. It's any back of the set antenna. Uh, we were using the Remtronics um, as a uh, as a display on it. But on your back of set antenna, um, try tilting the antenna left, right, uh, forward, back to try to find that sweet spot where it works the best. So uh, sometimes you know you may want to lengthen the antenna or shorten the antenna if you've got the telescoping one, um, or if you've got a rubber duck antenna like this one. Uh, if you lean it towards the right or to the left or forward or backwards, then uh, you might find that spot that works really really well. If you don't have um, you know if you don't have anything like that, um, then you know you might want to try some other things. But with that back of the set antenna, uh, especially the telescoping ones, sometimes uh, on 800 megahertz, normally you're going to want to have it uh, put all the way down because the uh, that makes the antenna more resonant on 800. So you want to kind of retard the resonance of the antenna. So you lengthen the antenna to make it less effective on 800, and that will reduce the ability to go to site A and site site B and keep just site C. On a rubber duck antenna, again, tilting, or even on the uh, uh, telescoping antenna, if you tilt it over to the right or to the left, uh, backwards or forwards, get um, a, you find that sweet spot. Once you find that sweet spot, it might not be the same tomorrow. What works for you today might not work um, tomorrow because uh, whatever for whatever reason, it's the only thing that's predictable simul about simulcast is that it's unpredictable. So you might have to adjust it tomorrow and kind of uh, find that other sweet spot. And if you do it a couple times, you're going to find the couple spots that work the best. And if spot A isn't working well for you, then spot B might. Yeah, I mean, the definite thing, I mean, this is something that we tend to move away from putting a back of set antenna because we want to improve reception. Yeah, and, and sometimes this is better than your outside antenna. Yeah, I mean, in the case of simulcast, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, this is, I mean, the Rimtronics antenna certainly got a good name for it. You may not want to use a Rimtronics antenna if you're having... Yeah. A lot of issues, like Rich was saying, with simulcast. Yeah. Again, sometimes a better antenna makes things worse. So um, I mean, it's so crazy. We usually spend a lot of time talking about making things better. Yeah. In this case, you know, the tips and suggestions that we recommend for making things better is not going to be good for simulcast. Yeah, absolutely. And you've got... Um, you've got a lot of different things that you can try and sometimes they work sometimes you don't uh, it doesn't but do what you can to try to make it work and once you find something that works remember it and then you know it might not work again tomorrow but it might work again on friday yeah very much so and a lot of times you know we've talked about reception you know let's say you and your neighbor are both scanner enthusiasts your neighbors up the street they might have a different situation where certain things work for them and those certain things may not work for you because of your line of sight to yeah. that to that site yeah and 
the, and like, like I was saying before, the only thing that's predictable about simulcast is that it's unpredictable. And it changes from day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute. I had it once in my old place back in Illinois. I had it set perfectly. I was picking up that system perfectly for 30 minutes. And then it started going all wonky again. Wow. So the paperclip. Here we go. We've got the example of a paperclip. So Rich actually photographed his 436 with the paperclip on there. And you kind of made it a little directional antenna there. Yep. Uh, that will uh, uh, give you a little bit of directionality. And I actually noticed it while I was taking that picture. When I had the uh, my photo box set up this way, I got a better signal than I had it when it was set that way. I could have turned the uh, my little tiny yagi you can make a yagi antenna out of some paper clips <laughs> yeah so, i mean everybody's got paper clips around the house yeah absolutely um and yeah i said again try it just be careful uh there's two things to remember first off if your paper clips are those coated ones like this one those colored ones you may have to scrape off the coating from the uh, part that goes into the radio because that's an insulator. Mm -hmm. And also make sure if you have an SMA radio that you're using a small paper clip um, because the, those larger paper clips um, are actually too big and you might damage the antenna connector. If you've got a BNC radio, if you put a small paper clip in there, it might be too loose to stay in there and make a good connection. So you might use a larger paper clip for the BNC because the hole size is a little bit larger. So depending on the radio, large paper clip for BNC, small paper clip for the SMA, mm -hmm. avoid the uh, the coated paper clips right. as much as possible. Yeah, and if you're stuck, that's the only one you've got, just remember to uh, scrape off the coating on the part that goes into the radio. Don't worry about the rest of it. It doesn't matter. It's that part that goes into the radio that has to be clear metal. Perfect. So this is a household fix for yep. the SDS, and we're going to dive into another household fix. Look at that. Most people have a baking pan. Yep. Rich, so you set this up. So you've got your 436 and you've got the baking pan. Now, what is the baking pan helping the radio do? It's acting as a reflector. So remember our Yagi antenna that focuses all the antenna power um, or the capabilities in one direction. Mm -hmm. What the reflector does is it kind of replicates that in that it blocks the signals from behind the radio and helps focus it somewhat to the other side. So let's say the radio is on the north side of your of your pan. The stuff that's south of the pan is going to be blocked by the pan. Metal uh, kind of block tends to block radio signals. So it's going to block most of your reception to the south while it helps focus things to the north. So you're going to have a little bit further reception to the north than you would have had without the pan. You're going to have a whole lot less reception to the other direction from you know behind the pan so you can use this to kind of focus your antennas uh, uh, capabilities towards that tower versus that tower and you may have to kind of rotate things rotate things around a little bit direction to get your best sweet spot and like we said before what works on today wednesday might not work so well tomorrow but it might work again on friday so you may have to turn that around a little bit here and there Yep. Um, and then you may want to purchase an extra one of those baking pans. Um, yep. may not want to pull from the kitchen one. Uh, Dollar Tree, that's all over the country. You probably could pick up a, a baking pan there and you won't have the wife looking for or the husband looking for the baking yep. pan when they're making cookies. I got in trouble that way. I also use uh, baking pans. Uh, when we first moved in the house, I had uh, we it was summertime. I couldn't get up in the attic. It was too hot. So I had the little Spectrum Force mag mount antennas, and I grabbed a couple of baking pans from the kitchen and put them on top of a big uh, bookshelf here in my office. They worked great until the day my wife needed the pans to make some uh, cookies or whatever she was making. She was not happy. She, yeah. tear, she tore apart the kitchen for 20 minutes trying to find these darn pans. And you had them. And I had them. And then she said, where are these pans? Uh, oh, yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the great thing about it is just being able to think outside the box. I mean, the yep. other thing, too, is if you have, for example, this is another thing that you can do with your 800 megahertz beam antenna. Uh, let's say you have a brick uh, home. Mm -hmm. and your mass goes below the roof line and you have that antenna pointed in the direction away from the house and that's where the site is you could even block even more interference by scooting it down below the roof line because the, the the structure will will carry as a reflector as well to be able to reduce down yeah and you can use almost anything metal if you've got a uh, aluminum siding house or you're in a manufactured home you can use the side of the residence as your reflector yeah i mean there's so many great things about it the other thing is just moving your scanner around in the room may actually help things as well getting yeah. it away from the exterior window yeah absolutely there's there's all kinds of things you can do and the neat thing about it is if it doesn't work try something else But yeah, I mean, that is super cool. I mean, that's thinking outside the box there. Now, this is a real simple thing. You don't really need to do a whole of a, a heck of a lot other than loosening that squelch, not having that squelch so tight. Um, you know, the, the when you have squelch tight, it's basically zeroing in on some of those weaker signals, trying to pull those weaker signals in. When you open the squelch, it's going to make it so those weaker signals are not pulling in as much. Yeah. This is something simple that you can try doing right off the bat and see if what happens, you know, you may lose some of the um, lose some of that simulcast issues. Yeah. Again, like you say, try it and see if it works. The other thing that was on the list of suggestions is the attenuator. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the attenuator will either wipe everything out or it will, you know, help with the simulcast issues. Yep. Um, the uh, And if you don't have an attenuator um, built into your scanner or you don't know how to use it, you can actually buy uh, little attenuators that go in line with your BNC connector. Um, and there are actual physical devices you can get in there. Or... Try popping in a couple adapters in there. And remember, every adapter you put between your radio and the antenna adds some attenuation or loss to the line. Sometimes that's a good thing if you don't have any attenuators, but you got a box full of adapters. You know, pop in you know, a couple of adapters. It might look kind of funny, but it reduces the signal strength into the radio, and sometimes that's what you need. Yep, and that's uh, you know, I mean, that's another suggestion mm -hmm. there. Uh, is, did you see Ron's comment? Um, and uh, see, see, saw a radio reference people making the cardboard box reflectors. So you make the reflector with a car with cardboard, and then mm -hmm. you coat it with with tinfoil, of course, to um, you know to make it metal. Piece of cardboard by itself won't do it, but use that as the form for your tinfoil. Great yeah. idea, Ron. That is awesome. Um, the other thing that we've seen in past shows, which I don't have the photograph, is is someone placing a, a Yagi antenna at ground level, aiming yep. at a site. Yep. I mean, that you would think that would be the worst place to put an antenna, but that actually, for this customer situation or you know viewer, yep. um, it was the best situation. You know, it got the antenna. You know, the beam antenna low to the ground, aimed at that site, and then it, more than likely it's not going to pick up some of those other ones. Yeah, absolutely. You can get, uh, you're basically uh, directing the antenna's capabilities in one direction and reducing the ability of the antenna to pick up alternate sites by reducing its elevation. All good things there. Let's uh, continue on. And next week, we're going to do a series of shows, um, probably once a month, where we do a deep dive into some of the scanners that are available. Yeah. Um, as many of you uh, said that you wanted the 436, so it's a twofer, because the 436 brother-sister radio is the 536. So we're going to take a deep, deep dive 
into the 436 and 536. We're going to tell you about how, you know, what the tools are needed to program it, what the layout of the radio is, why should you consider a 436 or a 536. Yeah. And We're going to be an inside peek as well. Yeah, and there may be an inside look at, at the radio as well. So if you're uh, looking to tune in, definitely do that. Um, you can watch us, of course, on your Roku or Apple TV. Download the app and then search for the Scanner Guys. So next week's show will be Wednesday, June the 23rd. Uh, I can't believe it's already June of uh, 2021. June. Middle of June. I know. 8 p.m. Second Eastern half. Time. Uh, 5 p.m. Pacific, right here on the YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe to our channel. Do that right now. Um, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Train Aficionado Live. We're going to have another show next month. Um, not sure on the topic as of yet, but it'll be the day after 4th of July, Independence Day. Yep. Monday, July the 5th, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific. Follow, like, and subscribe to the Train Aficionado social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. And then check out the blog at trainaficionado.com. So make sure you hit the subscribe button over there as well. We've got some really good shows going on. We also want to uh, mention our sponsor, as always, Scanner Master. Since 1978, the nation's most experienced dealer of all brands of new police scanners, software, accessories, and programming. Shop them online or call the scanner experts at 1-800-722-6637. That number again is 1-800-722-6637. Open Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. And, of course, check out their website, open 24-7 for your shopping convenience at ScannerMaster.com. And if you have some technical questions or looking to see what the best scanner is for your area, email them, support at ScannerMaster.com. That's support at ScannerMaster.com. And tell them that Scanner Master, um, tell them that the Scanner guys sent you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I goofed that one up. Um, That's okay. We'll let it slide this time. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, make sure you subscribe to their socials as well. And uh, check out their website to sign up for their um, their newsletter as well. Some good stuff there uh, as well. So, um, once again, deep dive into the 436 and 536 next week. That should be a really good show. Yep. Um, you know, I mean, those radios are still relevant to this day. And they, they are not as expensive as the SDS uh, 100 and 200. Yeah, it's, if, if you don't have simulcast issues, they're the next best thing. Uh, they are workhorse radios. They're great because you can do all the programming right from the front panel of the radio if you choose to and you have the patience. Otherwise, you can use the Sentinel software. You can use the zip code database, or you can create your own custom programming in a favorites list. They are really the, the cat's meow for most people that don't have simulcast. Yeah, I mean, that is great. We're going to talk about it more in detail, so we're looking forward to... Um, you know, talking about them, I'm a huge fan of the 536. I actually have yeah. one in my truck. Um, I love the 536. It works really well. Um, and, of course, it works on, you know, all those other digital formats, you know, NXDN, uh, DMR, and Pro Voice if you do the paid upgrades. Yeah. Um, so that is great as well. Um, and, of course, they were the first radios that came out after the Home Patrol one came out that mm -hmm. gave you the ability like rich said to program through the keypad with the home patrol yeah. one it was very simplified you know it was yeah. very basic and it was ba it was uh unidin's first phase two scanners as well so and uh so they came out before the 996 uh, p2 and 325 p2 uh they beat that by a year or two and they were it, it kind of gave you a home patrol, all the home patrol functionality in a portable or a full-fledged mobile uh, radio. And I really do like it. I've got one in my truck and two here in the radio room. You've got uh, what, four or five there. You know. Yeah, I've got, a, I've got a couple of them and I've got yeah. one in my vehicle. I love um, the uh, 536. I'm just a huge fan of, you know, 
being able to to have all the radios program exactly yeah. the same way and then switching from favorites list. Yeah, exactly. Um, got some good news. Uh, if some of you follow us on Instagram, you saw that I posted a photo. The antenna is finally up. Oh, lucky you. Finally up. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to, um, to Austin Antenna. I've had this antenna for about 12 years. It was on my last house for about 10 years, and the antenna um, was really pretty decent shape. Um, there was yeah. a little bit of uh, uh, flaking, so I emailed uh, Paul over at Austin Antenna. He, he recommended what I needed to do. Looks like a brand new antenna on the yeah. roof. And, um, and, and that's I the uh, fiberglass. For those who are wondering, that's a fiberglass sheath over the metal part of the antenna. So. Yeah, and it looks great. Um, you know, Paul just basically emailed me. There will be a blog entry at, on rehabbing uh, one of these uh, ferret antennas. But yeah, um, I can't say enough about it. You know, I mean, it works just as great as as it did 12 years ago. So I put the antenna up. I also have an 800 megahertz antenna that's up there that's side mounted that's no longer produced. Which I was so bummed. Uh, Scanner Master yeah. used to carry this omnidirectional antenna. It's no longer produced, but you know I do have that up there. That works really well too. So I'm excited about that. We may do next week a live shot outside at the top of the uh, show, so you guys can see it live uh, on the yeah. air. Um, but yeah, that's really exciting. So if you want to see some photos of that, go to our Instagram. And check that out. Oh yes, the uh, antenna wax helps to clean and and get oh, performance. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, they got to have your antenna wax, and uh, you know it doesn't work without it. So. The other person that I want to thank, um, Dale Osborne, which uh, he's one of our viewers and a guest. Mm -hmm. um, I consulted him a lot on my concern about wind load. Um, Dale, I don't know if you're watching tonight, but you know, I took all your suggestions um, and uh, put it into my antenna setup. I can't say enough about it. You know, I appreciate um, you know all your help with this. Uh, just, I'm just uh, very excited yeah. that it's finally up. So, without further ado, let's right. jump into the questions. Now, some of you had some uh, some questions, so let's jump into that. All righty, so we've got um, Chris, uh, our buddy Chris from Michigan, uh, looking forward to the show, of course. Uh, he's going to be ordering a 436 pretty soon um, when his uh, county goes to the uh, state digital system. So uh, cool beans, uh, Chris, and uh, give us a call when you're ready. We'll get you taken care of. Um, Les is checking in from uh, Toronto area, and uh, they had a fifth alarm fire last night in uh, in a bakery up in the greater Toronto area. I don't know what it is about huge fires this week, but here in Phoenix we had a the largest fire event um, or structured structure fire event in the city's history last week. Uh, recycling yard caught fire, and uh, it was uh, I think they have up to six alarms, and then they called multiple specials. Uh, this last couple of days, they had a huge um, fire in the Rockford, Illinois area, about 100 miles outside of Chicago. Uh, chemical plant just went toast, and you could see the smoke for 100 miles. Um, and now they got the Sith alarm out in uh, Toronto. So it's uh, it's big fire week in uh, um, North America this week. Um, let's see here. We got a whole bunch of check-ins like we do every week and uh, we can't mention everybody but we will do our best um and uh joe says simulcast was a scheme uh, developed by motorola to tick off uh, scanner enthusiasts yeah um i kind of think that might have been part of it um and of course you know we've uh, discussed the simulcast versus multicast thing uh, kind of ad nauseum um and all scanners outside of the SDS, no matter what brand, Radio Shack, GRE, Whistler, Uniden, uh, they all have simulcast issues. Um, it doesn't really matter what brand you have. Some people say the Whistlers are better than Unidens. Other people say Unidens are better than Whistlers. It's uh, not always. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah, you must have a lot of RF in your room because it's affected your hair. <laughs> oh, yes, got to love it. Of course, I don't have enough hair to do that. So, <laughs> um, And uh, Joe said he's been having good success using his 436 and 536 with those methods. So, yep, you can do it. Hey, there so you go. You're back to the flathead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I uh, switched headphones, so I'm on the wireless ones right now. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, so uh, one of our Canadian uh, viewers asked if he can use the SDS 100 in Canada by posting in his, uh, punching in his postal code. Uh, yeah, the SDS 100 does include the U.S. and Canadian databases. Uh, so that which is fine. Which is awesome, and a lot of customers outside of the United States and Canada use the SDSs. Uh, they yeah. just have to program it either by using, um, you know, trying to work through the Sentinel software, which is not yeah. the easiest thing with programming from scratch. We can't say enough about um, Butel software. Yeah. So if you've got a 536, uh, a 436, an SDS 100 to 200, ARC. 536 yeah. is your software. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and a lot of people find it a lot easier to use than the Sentinel software. Uh, you can do it right from the keypad of the radio, but again, you got to have a lot of patience. Uh, I will say one thing about the U.S. and versus Canada on that. Um, in many areas, the U.S. Canada U.S. portion of the database uh, is more complete than a lot of parts of Canada, uh, just because of raw numbers. But that doesn't apply absolutely everywhere. But um, yes, you can use the SDSs or the X36s and the home patrols on both sides of the border with the uh, location-based scanning. Um, what if you put a scanner on top of a metal uh, pan or uh, a plate? Um, with a handheld scanner, uh, that will actually give you somewhat better reception in many instances not specifically for simulcast, but basically that plate is acting as a ground plane. So yeah. a vehicular antenna has got a ground plane because the vehicle itself is metal. If you take a look at other antennas, they usually have a vertical element and then horizontal elements. Those horizontal elements are your ground plane. If you take a look at a rubber duck antenna, it doesn't have a ground plane, but if you put the, the radio in the center of a metal plate, now you've got that plate acting as kind of a ground plane, it will enhance uh, your reception a little bit. Uh, so Danny, uh, it's not a uh, silly question, it's actually a very good question. Um, so let's see here, and the other thing to remember too is you can have simulcast trunking systems on phase one or phase two. Uh, they can be encrypted or in the clear. Um, and they don't necessarily have to be P25, although the vast majority of the simulcast systems are P25, and those are the ones that we're talking about. Analog simulcast systems don't have the same issue that the digital ones do. Uh, you might hear some heterodyning, um, where that's where the two transmitters are kind of beating against each other, but you're not going to have the massive digital issues that you have with the digital system. Uh, let's see here. Um, what uh, Jerry asked about a filter that blocks the lower band of the 700 megahertz band. Will that include the performance? Um, yeah, uh, oftentimes it will. Um, oftentimes a cellular band filter on the uh, frequencies on the cellular band um, will help your reception because you've got strong signals from cell towers relatively close to the frequencies you're trying to hear. If you can get a filter that has a sharp enough drop off on the cellular bands, oftentimes that will help your, uh, your scanner overall, not just on 800. Yeah, I mean, the filter certainly came in handy for a lot of uh, commercial yeah. customers that uh, the owner Rich has uh, worked with just because of the nature of them. A lot of their location, you know, like uh, a commercial, let's say like a television station, there's already a lot of RF there. They may uh, have a tower on the property where they could be renting space yeah. to a cellular company. So they're already combating that right in their backyard. Yeah. 
when we put up our new tower at the police station, which was actually bought and paid for by a cell company so they could put their cellular antennas on the same tower, we had a, a clause written into the contract said if there's any um, interference to our communications uh, from the cellular system, the cell company will have to uh, uh, remediate that. And luckily we had no such issues. Uh, and they were actually very good uh, you know, uh, tenants, I guess you would call them, on our tower, even though they built and paid for it and then gave us the tower and then paid us rent to boot. Uh, we never had a problem with their equipment or with their uh, activities on there. So, um, you know, sharing towers can be a good thing. Just make sure you understand if there isn't an interference issue, somebody's going to have to be responsible for it. Yeah, because that's the thing, you know, with having a tower that's shared, you could run into all types of things. Absolutely. So um, our buddy uh, Itel from Canada um, asked, that the stock antenna good enough for great reception? Uh, he heard that the Remtronics antenna gets better reception. So, uh, yeah, um, most of the time, uh, the stock antenna is good enough for most things. The Remtronics antennas do provide much better uh, performance depending on the antenna that you get. If you get the 800 megahertz Remtronics, uh, it provides uh, better reception on 800 megahertz. Uh, here's the uh, SDS version of the Remtronics 800B um, or the 800S that I just Oops. dropped. Um, it actually provides fantastic coverage on eight, seven and 800 megahertz compared to the stock antenna. The problem is, is that the 800 antenna doesn't work very well on UHF and VHF. So if you want to have reception in all three bands, your best bet is either the stock antenna or the uh, 830 antenna, which is a tri-band antenna. And I'm not sure if I got the right one. But anyways, I'm sorry, the 842 antenna, um, which has better coverage on 800 UHF and VHF than the stock antenna. So uh, look at the uh, Remtronics 842 antenna. It comes in both SMA and BNC version. And yes, the SMA version will fit on an SDS 100, as well as a 436 or a 396. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, oh, Dr. Dialtone, our buddy from Radio Reference is checking in from sunny Connecticut. Um, I bet you it's nice and cool there. It's probably only in the 80s there. <laughs> yeah, it's a, probably a lot cooler than what we're experiencing here. Oh, yeah. Well, it was 115 today. And it's going to be 119 uh, later on this week. So uh, it's going to be nice and toasty. Uh, that's why we don't go in the attic in the summertime out here. Um, yeah. That's yeah. why you use those uh, Spectrum Force antennas during the summer when you first moved in. You betcha. And I, I used them all summer long. And it wasn't until December that it was cool enough to go up into the attic. So uh, we were talking before about digital delay. Um, just to clarify, the delay um, that you're getting or the latency that you're getting when you're listening to a digital radio over the same traffic on the analog channel is the digital encode and then decode. Because remember, the the guy who's talking on the radio, it's coming into the microphone analog. It's being converted to digital, being transmitted, being retransmitted uh, in digital form to the user's radio and then converted back to analog. And that does cause a little bit of latency. So that's why on a digital radio, you're going to have that little bit of delay going in there. It could be as much as a half a second or so. Uh, let's see here, uh, Les is in the Greater Toronto area, and he says his unit scanner handles the Peel and the Toronto systems no problem. Um, so he's got simulcast in his area, but uh, he's got no problem. And again, that's what we were saying before. It might work just great, but then you try it tomorrow, and it might not work very well. So um, Joe uses an Ethernet termination load over a paperclip. So an Ethernet termination load is basically a uh, BNC connector, uh, a BNC mail with a resistor in it, and it's used to terminate Ethernet. And you put that on top of a BNC radio or even an SMA radio with a BNC uh, adapter, and you've got just enough exposed thing to get some signal on the radio, but it's very 
it makes it a very poor antenna, which means you're going to pick up that close sight and not the ones that are distant, and that might help very much. Uh, let's see here. Who doesn't love Yagis? Everybody loves Yagis, and they are directional. Remember the old CD yeah, days? Yeah, I mean, we carry, um, at Scanner Master, we carry, you know, not only 8 and 700 megahertz, we carry a couple other different bands as well. So, yeah. you know, let's say, for example, you're up in Maine and you're monitoring that system. That's a, a VHF system. You may want to consider one of those if you're trying to target one of those sites. Yeah. Um, I remember when I went to one of the Scanner Master open houses. Now, this was way back before I worked there. Um, they were in Needham, I think, or Newton. I don't remember where yeah, they were at that yeah. point. So um, so they were way in, and then the, they were monitoring Worcester, um, and the, which is a bit of a hike from, from that location. And they were demonstrating how you could use a beam antenna to aim at that trunk system in order to pick it up. Mm -hmm. So not only beam antennas are great for... Um, for simulcast systems are also great for trying to pick up systems that are far away mm -hmm. or, or sites that are far away. Let's say if you have some interest, you're monitoring like the Viper system yeah. or the Starcom system. And there's a certain site that you're interested in because you like the city or town that's affiliated with that particular tower site, which is not close to you. Yeah. Then you have the ability to use... Uh, a beam antenna try to aim at it and that's a really cool thing to do as well and the other thing too that some people don't understand or don't realize is that not all digital systems or even digital simulcast systems are on seven and eight hundred megahertz uh, no. some of them are vhf and uhf as well so um the same rules apply a directional antenna, just that a Yagi on VHF is much larger than a Yagi in 800. So you might have an antenna that's six feet tall and eight feet across, uh, whereas on an 800 meg Yagi, it's this big. It's not that big. So, yeah. um, I've even seen uh, low band Yagis. Uh, one of the state police posts back in Illinois had a low band Yagi on their post building. And uh, I must have been pointed at one of the uh, remote sites. And it was a three or four element Yagi antenna that was about 20 feet tall. Um, let's see here. Uh, Les has got a bunch of older scanners that uh, the 396 stock antennas work good. So he must be in a really good location for simulcast up there. I can tell you that the county that I'm in, um, is using simulcast. It's that perfect example that you used earlier with our mm -hmm. fictitious, uh, was it, uh, I'm drawing a blank on it. What is it now, Rich? Uh, Mayberry. Yeah. Mayberry County. So the county that I'm in is exactly what you've, uh, you know, like five, I can't remember how many simulcast sites they're here, uh, but they're all linked together, of course. And and I have, you know, up the road is one of the uh, sites. So it kind of drowns out everything else. So yeah. it works out well for me. I'm happy that I'm not in the middle of the county because I would be just like that, uh, that photo that we showed, yeah. um, you know, right in the middle of it and getting all types of interference. So that's why on the local county, I can actually use... Uh, uh, 536 and not experience any of those simulcast issues yeah. whatsoever. I live in the far, far, far corner of my county, and I'm way, way off on a one edge of the, the entire metro area. So, I mean, in so far out that you know, it's a three hour drive to get to the other side of the county. It's a thirty-minute drive just to get to the grocery store, but yeah, it's it's a long way. It's a long trip, and that means I can usually only pick up the one simulcast site from the tower that's near here, which works out great for me on that particular simulcast site. But I tell you what, as soon as I get into town, then the five thirty-six is all but useless. The SDS works great. So location, yeah, location, I mean, location. It's I was just going to say that, you know, we're in prime location with a simulcast system that yeah. we're not seeing 
the results of it. And sometimes with my 536 in the vehicle, mm -hmm. I can, you know, depending on where I'm at, I will experience some simulcast issues because, you know, it's an uncontrolled environment. I'm yep. traveling in my car with a 536, so I'm going to get into sections of, you know, where there's multiple signals coming. I'm going to get the burping and the hiccuping and all that business. Yeah, absolutely. It's like a, you know, it's like a, you know, driving home from the bar after you've tied one on. It's going to be burping and making all kinds of weird noises. Um, Nate had a great, uh, uh, a great uh, suggestion, and um, I we should have mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, SDRs um, are another um, alternative to uh, an SDS. Remember, the SDS is basically an SDR built into a scanner, but you can get real, you know, SDRs yourself and let the computer do the processing. Um, you know, SDRs are great, uh, and they are getting better all the time. Um, obviously, they've got some limitations. You, they don't work without the computer for the most part, um, and there are some other limitations. You have to do a lot of computer work to make them work. But they are a viable alternative for a lot of people, um, and they uh, some of them do provide good uh, simulcast performance. Um, Ron, uh, our buddy Ron out of Michigan, is saying that the, the Unidens that definitely do better on simulcast, the attenuators helped. Um, so yeah, in that's particular area, that's yeah. one of the suggestions we made was uh, try something. With yep. the attenuator, and it's just like you said, trial and error. You know, see yeah, what absolutely. works and what doesn't. And in his experience, the uh, the whistlers have not uh, fared so well. I've had other people tell me that, yeah, I could pick it up on my PSR six hundred, but I can't pick it up on my nine ninety six. So, you know, your mileage may vary, or for our location, Canadian, yeah, for our Look. Canadian friends, your kilometers may vary. So. And it's location, location, location. Yet again, you know, one radio will work outperform the other. Absolutely. So, um, so yeah, like I say, uh, Dan agrees. Uh, so wherever Les is living, he's living in a charmed area because uh, if he's in a metro area like Toronto, which is what the third largest metro area in the in the, in the continent, um, it's uh, um, they, there's a lot of simulcast there. So he's obviously in a particularly good location. Um, other things to consider are uh, you can make your own directional antenna with um, by putting a radiator inside of a coffee cup or a coffee can or some sort of metal can. Um, back in the days when Wi-Fi was still a new thing and the kids are out there calling war driving, they would make Pringle can antennas uh, and make a, a hyper-directional uh, antenna that worked on Wi-Fi frequencies out of a Pringles can, um, and that was a big thing back in those in those days. So, uh, let's see here. Um, other alternatives: paper clips when you had to replace an antenna and you had to wait for his replacement. So yeah, sometimes if you straighten the antenna out, uh, uh, straighten the paper clip out, it'll work. And sometimes, you know, like I say, just a piece of wire. Um, and it might work well as a regular antenna as well if, you know, pull, make it all, you know, straighten it all out. In a pinch, you know, it gets a piece of metal in the air. That's the whole thing. Um, the whole idea. Uh, get something up and get something out, and that makes it work. And then, you know, you can degrade it to make it work better on simulcast. Uh, there was a question about the antenna that I'm using on my 436. Uh, that actually came off of an ICOM radio that I no longer have, um, and it seems to work pretty well on um, aviation. That's why I had it in my 436. So if you're like me, you probably have, well, I've got coffee cups full of antennas. Yeah, and that's I'll, what I have, a whole slew of them. <laughs> yeah, and I'll try them out on different frequency ranges and uh, see which one works best on what radio, either aesthetically and performance-wise. So the reason I snagged this antenna was because it works really well in aviation and it snug fits really well on the radio. So uh, let's see here. Makes a good conversation piece. Yeah, it's a great way if you you know if your spouse says yeah you know we don't we never talk 
just start stealing her cake pans out of the uh, kitchen, and you'll start talking. <laughs> you may not like what she says, but uh, at least she'll be talking to you. Um, let's see. Uh, get your scanner away from the neon signs. Yeah, we showed the picture of the neon sign in one of those uh, slides. Uh, you don't want you don't want to have your scanner near a neon sign. They are notoriously bad RF wise. Uh, you know it's actually even worse than a neon sign. Have you ever noticed when you pull into a gas station, your scanners just go. All the computers from the pumps and all that interference yeah. there is just. Uh, yeah, I've heard that the Exxon stations oh. are the worst. They had I don't know if they still have them, but they had these things called. Um, uh, gas pass or mobile pass or yes. something like oh, that. Yes, oh, I know. Yeah, fast the pass. Uh, fast pass, yeah. And I had that, and every time I went into a mobile station, it's an RFID thing, so it's basically sending out broadband radio signals from the gas pump, and you can see the antennas, the loop antennas at the top of the gas uh, pump, and boy, those things were noisy. My scanners just went nuts. I'm sure, yeah. I mean, oh. I experienced that as well. Yep. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's ask how good is a metal shelf at this front window as a covering for his air conditioner? Because he can lay the 436 on it sideways. Yeah, try it out. You, that might work. And it might work as a good as a ground plane, even not to make it directional if you set the antenna up on it. So uh, let's see here. You can buy multiple uh, F connector attenuators. And use adapters because remember you're reducing the signal. So adding adapter just makes the signal even a little bit lower. And it acts as like an extra attenuator. Uh, foil pi uh, pie plates are also good, less cumbersome. Um, yep, you can do that. Um, mount the antenna on um, the uh, bottom of the uh, um, uh, of the can. Let's see here. Um, oh man, all of a sudden somebody posted a new message and the thing scrolled to the bottom. <laughs> well, I, I, hold on, yeah. you're right, I can get you. I found it, yeah. Mount the antenna on the bottom uh, opposite the open end. So, yeah, you can do that. Um, and let's see here beer cans, yeah, or soda cans if you're so inclined. I was eating dinner right up into showtime, and I was still finishing my soda. I can only drink soda while I'm eating dinner, so. It's the only time I'm allowed to drink soda anymore. <laughs> um, a question about the SES-100. Oh, yeah, uh, you got ahead of me there. On the SES-100, about the uh, mini USB port. So if you take a look at the side of your SES-100, you're going to see two USB ports. There's going to be the mini and the micro. The mini is the one that cable comes with that uh, plugs into the mini. That can be used for everything, including your GPS, charging, you, uh, power, uh, programming, uh, and the whole bit. That can be used for everything. Right now, that micro, the smaller one, the upper one, is used only to power the radio. So if you're going to be plugging in your um, GPS, uh, you're going to go into there. Now, as far as which pin the actual GPS data goes into, I don't know um, off the top of my head. Um, but when you buy the GPS uh, kit from the unit and GPS kit that works on all the scanners, there's a cable that works on the 325 and the SDS100, and it goes into there, and then not only does it bring the GPS data into the radio, but it also powers and charges the radio battery at the same time. So um, I don't know if it's actually pin four, which is your question, Bob, but um, I'm sure somebody might know. Uh, Dave got his 436 back uh, that he had sent off for repair. They replaced a couple chips, so now he can monitor again. That's good. It's always nice to get your radio back after you send it out for repair. Um, let's see here. Uh, is there a recommended way to uh, bring the antenna line into a house? Um, the best way to get the antenna line into the house is the one that's going to get it most directly to your radio from the antenna. Yeah, the I mean, path. and 
in my application, I have a crawl space because I'm in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going out. Um, so basically through the floor mm -hmm. and then out through the uh, through the doorway of the actual uh, crawl, you know, where you get in the crawl space. And it's literally my, I'm right here. My antenna is on the other side of the wall. So it's the shortest yeah. path. Um, and like Rich said, yeah, best way is the most logical and shortest way. Yeah. There's a few things to remember when you're bringing, a, if you're going to bring an antenna cable into uh, the house from the outside, um, if you're going to drill straight through the wall, drill the hole slightly upwards from the outside um, so that the hole on the inside is slightly higher than the hole on the outside. Um, and that helps keep water from ingressing into the house. Uh, also, make sure any holes that you drill are properly sealed to prevent that. But if you drill that hole at a slight, I mean, just a slight angle upwards a little bit, uh, that will help also to prevent uh, water regress. And don't forget to ground your outside antennas. We can't stress that enough. Um, but again, yeah, the shortest way is the best. Um, where can you find a decent guide to use as a uh, Whistler TRX one and two? Um, I would go to markscanners.com or buy the easier to read manuals. I think we have those uh, on our site, uh, at Scanner Master, um, or you can read them online. Uh, they are a much easier to understand manual than the manual that comes with the radio. Uh, also, look to YouTube for videos on how to work the Easy Scan software. Um, I think it's a little more complicated to use than the uh, Sentinel software. Um, that's that's just my opinion. Um, you get a lot of people who like their Easy Scan software better than the Uniden software, but the one thing with the TRX is the only software that works with the TRX one and two is Easy Scan. There are no third-party alternatives. This is a question we get a lot about uh, open sky. No scanner will work on open sky, unfortunately. But a lot of these open sky systems are moving over to a system that can be monitored, such a P twenty five phase one or phase two system. Yeah. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, open sky or I, I know there's some other names for open sky that people have said during the show, which I can't think of any of the funny yeah. ones off the top of my head. Sky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, unfortunately, no scanner will work on that. And I think that's kind of going away to the wayside. I mean, there's yeah, uh, open sky has been a culprit of, of so many different issues. Yeah, and they had a lot of uh, issues implementing it <coughs> in certain areas. Um, there's huge debacle in Pennsylvania and New York. Uh, there were several successful open sky installations, Oakland County, uh, Milwaukee, um, a couple of uh, towns in suburban Chicago uh, actually had pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty good luck with it. Um, but there are so few of them, um, and there were so many issues on some of those systems uh, that they, it just never really took off. And the few systems that are remaining are starting to be converted to P25. I would imagine that uh, Oakland County is going to be pretty heavily encrypted according to some of the comments and the fact that they've been not monitorable for the 15 years or so they've been on open sky they'll probably want to continue that garberly voice yeah i mean digital i mean mm -hmm. when digital radios break up even when it's not simulcast you will get that garbly uh, or it'll sound very yeah. digital like the dispatcher like you'll hear them say on a digital system you sound digital you know when it's going blah, 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 blah. So yeah. yeah, you will get on digital systems on VHF, UHF, seven and eight hundred megahertz. You will hear that digital hiccuping. Yeah, and you're going to get the. It works very much like eight hundred. The only difference is that there's a lot more eight seven and eight hundred megahertz P twenty five systems out there than there are uh, UHF and VHF. So um, let's see here. Um, yeah, simulcast can be uh, disrupted by too much signal or too little signal. So, yep, um, you know, sometimes too much is not enough. 
Uh, can you set up a uh, favorites list on a SDS 100 like the scan list on a TRX-1? Uh, yeah. yeah, basically it's the same concept. It's just different ways of getting there. So Yeah, um, the cool thing about it is, is yes, is scan lists and favorites lists. You know, I mean, the, the great thing about I like about the scan list is, you know, with the favorites list is you can have as many as you want in there. Yeah. With the scan list, I think you're limited to the set number of lists that are there. Yeah. Um, and then he follows up a couple minutes later. Uh, he didn't actually mean scan list in that respect, but he's, can you do the favorites list like a V folder on the uh, TRX? So not really. But since there is so much room on the SD card for on an SDS-100, um, you can fit hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, of scan lists. And I'm not sure what the limit of the scan lists. I think I'm thinking 500, if I recall correctly. I'm not sure, but there might be some numerical limit. But there, you're never going to fill up the SD card. And if you want, you can make multiple SD cards. And we we recommend always that you have a backup SD card anyway. But you, there's no reason why you couldn't make mu multiple SD cards with different lists of of, of uh, favorites lists on it if you wanted to. Yeah, uh, I, I've known people that have done just that. Um, so yeah, you know, whatever works for you. So uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, Charlie's got a 996 and an SDS 200. He tried every trick in the book, uh, and finally the SDS worked. So, um, but he went to some simulcast sites in northern Michigan and it worked fine there. So, um, again, remember what we said before: location, location, location. <laughs> drip loops. Oh yes, don't forget the drip loop. Uh, Terry asked earlier about running the antenna cable into the house. Don't forget your little drip loop. What you do is you put a little loop in the uh, coax before it enters the building. And when water travels down the coax, it gets to the bottom of that drip loop and it can't go back up again. Water will not flow upwards unless it's pushed. So when it's dripping down a piece of coax, it gets to the bottom. It's not going to go up and make the round. So when you've got your little drip loop in there, uh, you don't forget to put your drip loop in there. So thanks for that reminder, Chris. Uh, let's see here. Um, open sky zombie system, dead system walking. Yeah. Um, the one thing to remember with both EDEX and open sky, if they're not EDEX now and they're not open sky now, they won't be in the future. So they won't be an issue for you because they are no longer selling those systems. Open cry. <laughs> um, open sky. How does open sky work? Um, well, since you can't monitor, it doesn't really make that big a difference, but basically what it is, is um, it's an IP system. Uh, it ver works very much like internet. Your radio is a subscriber to it. It has an address and you connect to it just like you would connect to a computer network. It's basically a network with an antenna connecting things instead of an ethernet cable. And you log into the system, it recognizes your radio and says, okay, you're Officer Smith, and off you go. Um, and they do make, uh, uh, Harris made some radios that are capable of doing open sky, EDAX, and P25 trunking at the same time. So, um, you know, they, they will do all three of those, but Motorola never made a radio that will do EDAX or open sky. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, gain antenna is the higher the gain, the narrower the band. Yeah, that's a factor of the antenna itself. So when you have a, a Yagi antenna and you have, say, uh, three elements, uh, it's going to give you, let's say, 4 dB of gain, and it's going to be this long. You add more elements. Uh, to it and it gives you more gain so you might have 10 dB a gain but the path that it works on is going to be narrower so the path might be this wide with a 3 dB gain antenna with three elements and only this wide for a higher gain antenna so the longer your beam uh, your boom length is and the more elements 
the narrower your path or your error possibility is going to go. So with a smaller beam antenna, a smaller Yagi antenna, you can be a little more general in your direction. You kind of just point it in the right direction and you're probably going to be good. On a much larger antenna with more elements, you're going to have to be a little more careful on your aiming because it's going to have much narrower uh, capability. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, Open Sky, yeah, well, for, uh, did have some option or some uh, 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 good things for it. Uh, it had four talk path options that you can have four uh, users on the same uh, channel at the same time. You know, like a phase two system, you can have two talk paths on one frequency. Uh, same thing with a DMR. But Open Sky, you can actually squeeze four paths on one frequency. So it gives you more capacity at less voice quality. Um, it does reduce the voice quality. Uh, v folders are startup keys. Yeah, uh, there is a lot of similarity between uh, startup keys and V folders. Um, again, there's very low, uh, very high limits on the capabilities, the storage capabilities on a uh, SD card scanner. So you probably really don't need to worry about that. You know, I've got a couple hundred scan lists on my uh, scanners, and I just turn on the ones that I want at that particular time. Uh, let's see here. Um, apparently, Uniden is getting their repair uh, times uh, um, uh, cleaned up. They had some uh, bad uh, press for some of the times on their repairs, but apparently they're getting better on that. So, um, oh yeah, we um, we're not going to mention the uh, Bearcat 125 today and the fact that it's not been discontinued. So we we won't mention that at all. So, although we just did. <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah, I guess we did. <laughs> and let's see here. Um, and Jerry asks, why is local Harris P twenty five system sound louder than the uh, P twenty five phase one systems in this area? Um, it could be a multiple things. It might be just that particular system. Uh, it might be uh, something with uh, your scanner or your location. Uh, I've never heard of that being a general um, thing, but who knows? It could be. And there's one relatively simple way to tell if a P25 system was built by Harris or built by Motorola. Uh, Motorola, you're going to have a control channel, a a, uh, a main control channel, or a uh, I forget the term uh, terminology it escapes me. But you're going to have one main control channel and two or three alternate control channels, a primary and one, two or three alternates, and then all the other channels would just be regular voice channels. And you look at the radio reference database. Uh, the red and the blue channels are your primary and alternate control channels. On a Harris system, all channels on that system can be control channels, and they'll rotate through the whole, a whole bunch of them instead of just being limited to two, three, or four channels like you would have on a Motorola system. So if you see five or all channels on a system uh, listed as control in the radio reference database, it's a good bet that it's uh, built by Harris. So... And the other thing that people get confused about is the difference between phase one and phase two and type one and type two. So phase one and phase two, it means that a phase one means a P25 system that transmits one voice path on one frequency. And a phase two system is two talk paths on one frequency. So on a five channel system, one channel being a control, you can have eight voice paths on a phase two system and four voice paths on a phase one system. A type one and type two system refers to the older Motorola trunking systems um, that could be either analog, digital, or a mixture of both. And that just affected uh, the way talk group numbers uh, and users were assigned. You either had um, fleet, uh, fleet maths, 
uh, fleet maps on a type one system and no fleet maps on a uh, type two system. So yeah, kind of similar terminology, but not quite. It's like simulcast versus multicast. It's the same con uh, the the concepts are different. Uh, the phraseology is kind of similar. And let's see, uh, Harrison Kenwood. Okay, so apparently uh, Kenwood is making uh, P25 systems on the Harris model. And uh, I think that's uh, pretty much... Um, oh, yeah, and the, uh, the WACN uh, coats, the Wacken coats, are different setups on Motorola versus Harris. On Motorola systems, if I recall correctly, on Motorola systems, the Wacken code uh, is... Um, usually just B-E-E-O-O -O or something like that. It's usually the same on most systems. It's just the system ID is different on each system. On Harris systems, I think they all use pretty much the same system ID, different whacking codes to differentiate the system. So, again, it's just a, a different takes on the same technology, on similar technology. So, um, And I think that's uh, pretty much it, my friend. All right, so next week, make sure you tune in to the Scanner Guys. We're going to be taking a deep dive into the unit in Bearcat BCD 436 and 536 HP. If you're watching us on YouTube, did you know you can watch us on your Roku TV or Apple TV? Uh, download the YouTube app on one of those platforms, and you can search out the Scanner Guys. Next week's broadcast will be Wednesday, June the 23rd of 2021, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific, right here on the Scanner Guys YouTube channel. So we hope that you join us uh, next week uh, for a great show. We want to remind you once again that Scanner, the Scanner Guys have brought you by Scanner Master. Since 1978, the nation's um, most experienced dealer of all brands of new scanners, software, accessories, and programming. Shop them online or call the Scanner Experts at 1-800-722-6637. They're open Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, you can check them out on their website, ScannerMaster.com, and email any support questions or questions about um, scanners at support at ScannerMaster.com. Follow, like, and subscribe to their social media as well, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, and uh, you can follow them at ScannerMasterCo. And... Make sure you follow, like, and subscribe to Train Aficionado. Um, we host the show each and every month, the first Monday of the month. Uh, Monday, July the 5th, will be our show on the Train Aficionado YouTube channel. We haven't decided the topic, but we'll have one uh, relatively soon. 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific. Um, subscribe to their YouTube channel and check out the social media as well, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. And uh, check out the blog as well at trainaficionado.com. And we can't forget, last but not least, our social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram, The Scanner Guys. You can find us on all those social media platforms and check out our website, thescannerguysshow.com. And as always, The Scanner Guys, with uh, myself and Rich, are brought to you by Scanner Master. So uh, we had a great show tonight, and we're so happy that you joined us. Um, we have next to address week. a complaint. We have to address a complaint. Sorry. Uh, you can also watch us on YouTube on your Fire Stick. So we forgot YouTube to YouTube on your that. Fire Stick. Okay, I, I didn't know that. I don't I have a know Fire that Stick either. But uh, Dave is very insistent that uh, we can use it on a Fire Stick. So Dave, thank you. Uh, you can do that. And we'll too. have to add that in, Rich. Or remind me to add that into our slide. You know, the you Fire it. Stick. All right. Well, I thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. If you're watching us on your Fire Stick, your Apple TV or Roku, or on your old-fashioned computer, smartphone, tablet, um, iPad, <laughs> Android. Um, if it's got a wire attached to it, you can probably get it. Yep. <laughs> CB Fire Stick antenna. Yeah. Yeah, there is. Isn't there a Fire Stick antenna? There is, but the Fire Stick he's talking about is a kind of like a Roku device. Okay, cool. All right. Well, I thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Anything else you want to add, Rich, before we uh, sign off? No, I think I'm good. So thank you. <laughs> uh, you're welcome. Sorry about my poofy hair earlier <laughs> in the broadcast. I was switching. 
from yeah, my wireless. Yeah, I don't have the ability. I have the desire, but I don't have the ability to go poofy. <laughs> I'm sure that we. Yeah, I'm sure there's something else through Amazon, some sort of sticker device they have there too. Because I guess Amazon that's keeps the going. Amazon streaming okay. device. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there's so many devices. We're trying to keep up with it. Well, anyway, um, thank you so much. I'm Jonathan Higgins. I'm Rich Carlson. We'll catch you again next week right here on the Scanner Guys. Later, guys. Good night.